So this is the Battle of the Wilderness, 1864. It is the big battle. There was a lot of battles in 1864. This one, however, was key. And the reason why is, first time, Robert E. Lee versus Ulysses S. Grant. And for once, the Union didn't run away. How about that? Um, <laughs> so uh, because it was on Virginia soil uh, and uh, the Union Army, the Potomac Army of the Potomac, did not retreat, it's an important vic victory, if you will, a uh, strategic victory. That said, it was a tactical draw. Nobody really won the battlefield, per se, but um, it was important that because now the Union troops saw they had a general who would not run, which is important. The bad thing about wilderness, however, was it was brutal. There's a reason why they call it wilderness. Um, we don't have enough trees here. We would love to have more trees. It was packed with trees, but much worse, the ground cover was horrendous. Um, it was everywhere. It was very hard to move, soldiers were trapped, and so maneuvering a large army in these big Napoleonic-like structures that they did in those days, very, very difficult. Quite literally, in the 1960s, they were still finding bodies, skeletons, because they got lost, died, and then were never found again, yeah, never recovered. Really 1960s, still. Um, and so it shows how devastating this battle was. This is the southern side of the battlefield. The southern side of the battlefield, there was lots of interesting things that happened and, and none of it too horrendous. So what I mean is, on the northern side, you had some very tragic, acts, uh, horrible things happen. Um, a lot of guys burning to death just because they were trapped in the foliage. Here on this side, you had kind of a brilliant move by my favorite Confederate General Longstreet, James Longstreet, who redeemed himself after the war, in my opinion. He was a tactical genius. And what they had was a sort of a draw with all the terrain and both sides. But he saw this railroad cut. And he realized that the Union didn't even see it there. So what he did was he sent uh, Moxley Sorrell, his chief of staff, believe it or not, out with a couple, a couple uh, uh, brigades. And they snuck along the base of the railroad track uh, cut, which there was no railroad there at the time. It was just a cut. And those guys pop up up at the ridge the last second while they're assaulting from the left over here, cross the nice stream and just completely roll up the Union line. And uh, years later, when Longstreet and the man who commanded this formation, uh, Winfield Hancock, when they met after the war, Hancock just turned to Longstreet and said, you rolled me up like a wet blanket. So I had to betray that. I just had to betray that because it's so cool. Um, but uh, the Union was able to recoup and re re regather and then form back up over the Brock Road back there. But it was just kind of a neat moment. Um, we don't have enough ground cover. We don't have enough trees. We'd love to have more. Bottom line is resources are resources. We wanted to get this scene in there and we wanted to get Widow Tapp's farm in. And the reason why Widow Tapp's farm is important is this is James Longstreet, very, very famous for loving cigars. He's chomping on a cigar right now. Stonewall Jackson was known as Robert E. Lee's left arm. Longstreet was known as Robert E. Lee's right arm. And so Jackson gets killed in 1863, all right, uh, by his own troops, not four miles from this very position. Okay, And he was killed by accident. It was a fratricide. Minutes within what you're seeing here, quite literally within 20 minutes, some troops that were retreating back confused these guys they saw Longstreet and his staff, did not recognize them, they turned and shot. Longstreet receives a wound to the neck, and he is out for many months that were important. So now Lee has lost his left arm, he's lost his right arm, Lee's in trouble. And that's part of the reason why he keeps falling back in front of Ulysses S. Grant, because of that incident right here. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to include Widow Taft's farm too, uh, because that's a, that's a kind of a neat, neat moment. So that is the southern side of the battlefield. Um, I think we still have some troops to set up. I need to put some more water in the stream, uh, but other than that, we're out of ground cover. <laughs> so if you have any more of these and you're here, please, I'm begging. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that's a, that's a battle. That's a civil war this year. Next year, we're going to be doing Appomattox. Okay. So yeah, we're going to continue. And he and I looked at each other, and somebody asked recently, "You're going to keep doing this?" And we're like, "Why do we stop?" <laughs> it's wonderful because 
people are learning about the Civil War. And one of the things I'm, I'm kind of shocked about is how young people in our country do not understand. If you don't know the history of the Civil War, then you don't know our country. You don't. You don't understand. You don't understand why people behave the way they do. Why do we think how we do? Um, before the Civil War, um, the United States. When you asked a person, a for when a foreigner came to you and asked you as an American, "What's the United States?" Uh, an American typically at the time would answer, "The United States are multiple, right?" Okay. Now, though, when you ask people, hey, what is the United States? They say, oh, the United States is. There's only one reason why that happened. It's the Civil War. Because it fractured us, then it brought us back together. We stopped thinking we were born in our state and our state is first to we're a country. And from that, I think we became a much more powerful people, a much more powerful country. Um, the reason why Robert E. Lee fought for the South, he's a Virginian. He didn't like slavery at all. He didn't like. Uh, he didn't. He hated the idea of, of breaking away from the federal government. Like I say, he fought on the side of the federal government back there at uh, John Brown's Fort. But you were a Virginian. For, if you're born in Virginia, you're a Virginian first, and you did what your state did. So we changed. That changed everything for us, and that's why the United States. And it's also why the federal government is so powerful. People don't realize that. Um, part of the reason why we're looking at a very, very strong federal government right now is because of this war. Before we didn't have a strong federal government. So something like the 1860, or sorry, the 1965 Civil Rights Act could never have happened in a time, in a different time, unless you had a strong federal government. Yeah. Yeah. So, so but doing this, we're able to teach people and talk to them, and, and especially when the public comes in, we're able to address people. That's why we have the placards so that people can read and kind of stop and get more of it. Oh, yeah. And the, these are really fascinating. I love what you've done here. And like you were saying, I mean, it's, it's so important to know the history of things like the Civil War and even, uh, you know, like the, the Zulu uh, diorama build you have over there. I mean, that's something that a lot of, especially kids, would probably never have any clue what that is. Right, but then you yeah. see a Lego build like that, and you can explain it to them, and they can learn about it that way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So how did you first uh, come up with the idea of building more historical models like this. Did you first start out building these, or was this something you no. got into more as you... No, um, I started building for anything that would please my kids. I, I, I didn't have Lego as a kid. I didn't. Uh, but they loved them instantaneously, and so I'm like, oh, here's a way I could connect with my kids and have a lot of fun with them. And so I started whatever they liked. Ships, planes, pirates. Eventually went over to Johnny Thunder Adventurers. The Pharaoh's Labyrinth uh, kind of came out of that. But what happened was... Um, more, more than anything else, I began to see that this this little strange plastic brick has some value b besides playing with kids. You can express yourself with it. And whether you're doing wonderful mosaics, I don't know if you've shown any of those mosaics with the draw dropping, it's, it's an art form. It really is. And so you can start to express yourself. I love history. I always have loved history. And so it's a way to get kids to like history. So I think more than anything else, being part of Brick Fair did it. Uh, when I first started exhibiting maybe six years ago, five years ago, um, that's when I'm like, you know, I can get kids interested in history if I actually make a really, really cool mock, and then they're like, what's going on here? Why is that side fighting that side? Uh, I displayed at uh, Scouting for Bricks, and I talked to a kid for about 20 minutes on, on this war, and he knew nothing about it, and he walked away with more education than he got in <clears throat> public school. <clears throat> so, yeah. So that's primarily why I build in, in history. I love it. I know it. And um, and it, it's a way to share. Yeah. I think the kids love this a lot more than they like textbooks, right? Oh, for sure. Definitely. And yeah, as someone who's very interested in history myself and enjoys studying it, I really appreciate what you do here with all these builds. They're really great. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that very much.